thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everyone for your attendance today and give me a second okay uh, the title of my presentation is uh, data humanities in latin america communities networks and trends um, sorry that we are switching from Korean to English, and maybe I will use a little bit of the Spanish. Um, this presentation has uh, two parts. The first part is a, a brief overview of uh, the digital humanities trends in Latin America, especially in four countries, Argentina, uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And the second part, I will show who I envision the future of data humanities in Latin America. I will use uh, my own research, okay, in order to show what we can do with data humanities in Latin America, especially when we want to foster uh, <coughs> diversity there. Um, no. Okay, I want to start with this, with the meaning of the data humanities. This is a quote. Uh, from Alan Liu, he, he is a professor at, uh, uh, in the United States. And this question of disciplinary, larger than the question of disi uh, disciplinary identity, now preoccupying uh, digital humanities itself, as insiders call it, having reached a critical mass of participants, publications, conferences, grant competitions, in general, institutionalization, sorry for the pronunciation, and general, and general uh, visibility, the field is forming an identity. Okay, something interesting about this quote is that the idea of uh, academic field is related to some material components. These material components are uh, participants, publications, conferences. I mean, not about the object or the methods you use, but about how you create this uh, academic field using these components. I want to use this materialistic approach to talk about the data humanities uh, in Latin America. For this reason, I am talking about the countries, uh, about these four countries, because in these four countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, we have uh, associations. We have networks there. That's the reason uh, I am talking about these four countries. It's not because there, there are no data humanities in Peru or Bolivia or Ecuador. Okay, the reason is that in these countries we have uh, associations, we have a group of people who start these associations in order to uh, disseminate data humanities projects. The first example is, uh, oh, first, uh, I want to talk about Latin America. Uh, in English, when we use the word America, especially in the United States, America is, refers to the United States, no? like uh, the whole country. But in Spanish, America is the continent, okay, with a lot of countries. Uh, I am using Latin Amer la ex uh, the expression Latin America, and I want to emphasize what does it mean, or what uh, I mean with the expression Latin America. First, we have Hispanic America or Spanish America. When we use this, we are talking about the countries in uh, America, the country, not the, I mean, the continent, not the country, uh, where these countries have the Spanish as a language. Okay, here you can see in green, for example, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, Chile, okay, they are Spanish American countries because they talk Spanish. <coughs> for example, Brazil in orange is not considered a Spanish American country because Portuguese is the main language there. I am not using this expression. Another common expression to refer to uh, this area is Iberoamerica, okay, and it refers to all the countries that are related to the Iberian uh, area, okay? Iberian area, Spain and Portugal, and in this case, we include the Caribbean islands, Mexico, and also Brazil, because all their, all, all them were, uh, were uh, colonials or colonies in the past. Finally, I prefer to talk about Latin America. Okay, this is um, an idea that was created in the 19th century and it covers South America, Central America, Mexico, and the islands of, of the Caribbean. 
And here you can see in green all the, in green all the countries. Okay? Again, I am talking about just four of these countries. I am talking about Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. Okay? So because there you can find these um, material <coughs> associations okay? related to digital humanities. Okay? Again, there are digital humanities research in my country, for example, in Peru, also in Ecuador. Okay? But uh, this research doesn't have a lot of visibility right now. Unfortunately. First, I want to talk about the Asociación Argentina de Humanidades Digitales in Argentina. It was founded in uh, 2013. Okay, and here we have a definition. Something that I want to emphasize is the idea of community. Okay, this is idea. This idea you will see that will appear a lot in other associations. The idea of a community of a group of people who have some similar interest related to digital approaches to analyze uh, cultural products. It's an open community of practice whose essential purpose is to promo promote research, transmission, and dissemination of knowledge in the field of digital humanities from plurality and interdisciplinarity. And they also have a definition of digital humanities. And this is something difficult to find. I mean, when I research about the other association, associations in other countries, usually you don't have a definition of what is digital humanities. And right now it's very difficult to, to have a definition. We can talk about that. What does it mean? What, what is the meaning of digital humanities in general? But this association, they provide, they offer a definition. Uh, digital humanities do not constitute a thematic discipline, but a set of methodologies that cut across our areas of interest. Here in this definition, they want to emphasize the idea of a thematic discipline. Okay, but again, it's extremely difficult to find a definition of digital humanities. Indeed, in, so, in some social networks like Twitter, you have bots that they provide a definition of digital humanities every day. Mm -hmm. you know, like a robot who reads uh, books, something like that. And they provide a definition of digital humanities. It's very difficult to, to find a definition. That's something that we can talk about at the end of this presentation. Something interesting about uh, this association, something that uh, I think is good, uh, talking about this materialistic approach, is that they have a journal. Okay, they have a journal about digital humanities. They have three volumes. Okay, every year they publish a new volume. Three years from 20. 2020, 2021, and 2022, okay, they have this journal. I think it's the first journal about digital humanities in Latin America. There is another journal, but it's in Spain. I mean, another journal in, in Spanish, but it's in Spain. This is the first journal about digital humanities in Latin America. They publish just in English, in Spanish. Okay, and usually research related to Latin America. And they also have an international conference. That's good for network. Usually they have uh, presenters from uh, other Latin American countries, but also from Europe and the United States. Okay, this is the uh, fifth edition, okay, edition number five uh, of this conference. <coughs> this is another, another idea or another characteristic that we will see a lot uh, <coughs> uh, related to the inter humanities in Latin America. It's the idea of they need funding from the state. Okay? They cannot create this association without funding from the state. That's extremely important. For example, in the case of Argentina, okay, we have, they have the support from the National Scientific and Technical Research Council okay, that is uh, linked to the Argentinian government. Okay? For example, they have the Humanidades Digitales Lab, or the Digital Humanities Lab. I will show you very quickly the space here or the web page uh, okay okay this is a web page that is created with uh, funding from the government and here you can see some projects I will show you a project here for example uh, in la biblioteca digital the digital library okay they are they have a digitization project you have these important uh, books related to the Argentinian uh, culture. I want to show you one of them. You have a visualization of the book. 
you also you go you can also download the book this is the digital edition now you can download the book and you also have annot annotations okay it is basically they provide uh, three uh, three materials no the visualization they also provide the digital version and they also provide annotations okay that's the project I think that's one of the most important projects in Argentina related to digital humanities. We also have a laboratorio in this something like Digital Humanities Network Lab in Brazil. Okay, Digital Humanities Network Lab. It was founded just uh, three years or four years ago. Okay, uh, again is related to the government. Okay, they used funding from the Brazilian government, from the Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación, in order to create this lab. lab. Again, it's extremely important in Latin American <coughs> universities doesn't have enough funding to support digital humanities associations. Okay, uh, these associations depends on the government, government funding. And here in this definition, uh, again, they use the word community, okay, they, they talk, they, these associations talk a lot about the idea of a group of people researching together, okay, that's the idea of a digital humanities association in Latin America, um, another interesting idea is the idea of interdisciplinarity, the idea of have a lot of approaches, okay, in order they use these approaches to analyze uh, cultural projects or cultural objects. I will show you uh, uh, again an example, the, the, uh, different projects. And you can see that this is a very new association, just uh, four years of creation. For example, um, this timeline, this is an example of the... They have created different timelines. For example, uh, you know that there was elections like one month ago, okay, Lula won the election, and they created this timeline related to disinformation or misinformation. And this is an open project, it means that you can check all this uh, on the website. And they also they also have a project related to COVID. Okay, this is also a visualization, but you can also download all the data they used to create this. That's again something important related to data humanities. You want to create the visualization, or you want to create an object that people can check, can review, but you also want to provide all the data that you used in open access. Means that basically you can enter this uh, enter to this web page and you can download all the data if you want to use the data to create your own project or if you want to research using this data. This is an example of what uh, Brazilian data humanities researchers are doing right now uh, in the country. We also have the Red Colombiana de Humanidades Digitales. Basically, it means uh, Colombian Digital Humanities Network. It was founded in 2016. It's, again, pretty new, just six years. Okay, uh, the definition, again, the idea of community. Okay, the idea of a group of people researching together. Okay, and basically, they want to promote and support the field of digital humanities in Colombia. And this is, I think, the only one that is very related to universities. Usually you have uh, associations that have uh, uh, funding from the government, but this is one unique case in Latin America is because this association is have relation with different universities that have master programs. That's something uh, particular about Colombia. Usually you don't have master programs in digital humanities in Peru or Ecuador or Argentina or Brazil. This is a country where you have at least two or three universities with master programs in digital humanities. That's something interesting because 
you, you have the association, but you also have a group of new scholars who can uh, create new projects, all of them related to these master programs in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, Universidad de Antioquia, or the Universidad de Los Andes. We are checking some projects also here. I want to show you something interesting talking about uh, funding and about preservation. This is a project about uh, the political violence uh, in the Peruvian government, for example. We can enter here. This is a description, okay? And here you can see a network, a real network, talking about uh, the victims of the political violence in Peru. Okay, again, this is open, uh, this is open access. You can check the project, but you can also download all the data if you want to research about the same topic. That's, that's something that is really important for me. I think that's part of the definition of data humanities. You use data to create these projects but you also provide all this data in open access. Oh, this, uh, this other project about... Uh, okay, that's something that I want to show you. What happened here? Okay, you have a project, um, uh, a student in a master program wanted to create this project, have a beautiful web page at the beginning, but right now you don't have access. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with Funding. I think there's a general problem not only in Latin America. I think in general, there is a funding problem. You have funding to create your project, you have funding to start the project, but sometimes you don't have enough money to preserve <coughs> the whole project. Okay? I, we have a lot of examples like here, like, like this in Latin America. Okay? Yeah, you have a beautiful idea, you start everything, but at the end, you have a, this. Okay, and that's something that also we should discuss because I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately the data humanities project, projects are usually related to funding. Again, something that I want to emphasize is in Latin America, usually this funding comes from the government. And this is a good example because this is a university project. And universities usually, usually in Latin America have a very small budget. Um, finalmente, or finally, this is the Digital Humanities Network, okay, this is uh, in Mexico, and you can see that this is the only one that doesn't have the name of the country in the, uh, in the name of the association, okay, it's just Digital Humanities Network, but it's, uh, it's related to Mexico, okay, it was created in Mexico, but they decided to not use, okay, the name of the country, because, again, they talk about the idea of community, but they envision their selves that like Latin American community, not the, like Mexican community. They, they, the idea is that they talk, or they have researchers related to the whole Latin American area. This is the only association that is member of the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations that is the most important digital humanities association. I think it's important to show you all the countries that have associations related to uh, the Alliance of Digital Humanities organization. And this is important, again, because we are talking about funding, we are talking about a conference, we are talking about books. Basically, everything come here, okay, and everything is promoted here in the Alliance of Digital Humanities organizations. Here you can see a list of the associations that are related to uh, to it. You have the, this is America, the United States, uh, Australia, Canada, this is the Mexico, Latin America, but it's basically Mexico. I would say that 90% of the researchers in the Digital Humanities Network are placed in uh, Mexico. Uh, you have European, you have uh, uh, Germany, uh, South Africa, Japanese, Taiwanese, and you don't have, a, for example, a, a South Korea, or Korea, South Korea Association here, for example.
and they, they, they was uh, the Digital Humanities Network was the place of the 2018 Digital Humanities Conference, the biggest and most important conference uh, in Digital Humanities. They also have a, not a journal, they have a, a series of books. Every year they publish a new book since 2019. It means right now they have three books, three Digital Humanities books about Latin America. And they also have funding from the government. Okay, and we can check uh, another project, but this project is interesting because it's related to not Spanish. And that's something that I want to show you because it's related to the next part of the presentation. This is a dictionary okay, from Spanish and Zapoteco. It's an um, indigenous language. And that's something that I want to show you because in Latin America there is a, a lot of languages. Just to talk about my country, we have we talk basically Spanish, like 95% of the population in Peru talk Spanish, but you have also around 49 indigenous languages. It means that in Peru we have at least 50 languages. 95% of the population speak Spanish, but the other 5% speak another uh, 45 languages. Okay, and that's something that uh, I would like to do in the future. Uh, for me, that's the future of digital humanities in Latin America. They should start to relate these digital approaches to other languages, not only Spanish. Uh, for, this is a good example. This is a dictionary of uh, Spanish and Zapoteco. No, uh, basically, you can look for any word you want to translate uh, in this language. Just to talk about the future, uh, you, you can see that Latin America is a very diverse area. Just Again, just to talk about Peru, we have 50 languages in just one country. Um, and I, I think digital humanities should research about this diversity and we should uh, foster this diversity in Latin America. I will talk now about my own research in the last, I think, 15 minutes. Okay, and how I plan to use my own research in order to uh, try to promote diversity in Latin America, or in Peru in this case. Uh, something about Peru is that we have three uh, geographical regions. Okay, we have the coast, okay, this is next to the ocean, for the reason we eat a lot of fish, just like South Korea. And we have the mountains, okay, just, just here in the middle, okay, we have the mountains, and we have a large Amazonian area. It's very large. It's, you can see 95% of the whole country is part of the Amazon forest. Okay, but you have just 12% of the population. Okay, basically people live in, in the coast. That is only 11% of the whole uh, uh, country, but more than 50% of the population live in the coast. Just to give another example about this centralization, Lima, the capital, Okay, you have more than 10 million people. More than 30% of the total population live here in the country. Okay, I am, I use data humanities. I consider myself a literary scholar who use data humanities approaches. Is that basically I am focused on uh, literary products, okay, about books. That's my uh, object of research. And for this reason, something that I do, in my, I did in my dissertation, I analyzed how the Peruvian literature is represented in Wikipedia. For example, if right now I ask you, how many of you use Wikipedia in the last week? For example, can you raise your hand? How many of you use Wikipedia <laughs> no, in the last week? I use Wikipedia, okay? Basically, everyone uses it. I will say that students, scholars, researchers use <laughs> Wikipedia. I think right now is the main way we learn about something. Okay, if we want to know about who is the only Peruvian writer who won a, a Nobel Prize, we should, we probably go to Wikipedia, not to the library. Okay, that's true. And for the reason I wanted to study Wikipedia because it's the main way people uh, learn about Peruvian literature. Something that I do, I, I, want to, I want you to remember this, this difference between the coast, the mountains, and the, the Amazon. In Peru, we have 25 Peruvian regions, okay, 25 Peruvian regions. 
basically four, uh, four, let me check, five. Okay, we have five regions are in the Amazon. We have five Amazon regions in Peru. Okay, here you can see the Amazon regions are San Martin, uh, Ucayali, Madre de Dios, Loreto, Amazonas. Okay, five Am Amazonian regions in Peru. Here you have the list of birthplaces, okay, of Peruvian writers. Basically, it means that in the Spanish Wikipedia, the Wikipedia in Spanish, we have more than 300 Peruvian writers who were born in Lima, the capital. Okay, in the Quechua Wikipedia, okay, I analyzed the Spanish Wikipedia and also the indigenous language Quechua, the indigenous language in Peru, we have 78 Peruvian writers who were born in Lima in the Quechua Wikipedia. Okay, that's something interesting, but the most interesting part is here, in the lowest position. Okay, you can see that in both cases, we have zero writers from some Amazonian regions. Here, here's the example, Ucayali, Madre de Dios, and Amazonas, and in the Quechua Wikipedia is worst, because we have five Amazonian regions, and we have four with zero writers. Basically, if probably you want to know something about Peruvian literature, and you go to Wikipedia, you can think, okay, it means that people in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon, they don't write literature. Basically, that's the idea. If you see this and you don't know about, or you know nothing about Peruvian literature, your first idea is, idea is, okay, in the Amazon, people, maybe they don't write literature. They don't create literary products. And maybe they don't consume literary products. Who knows? But you have zero, 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 okay? Always related to the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon. And I wanted to understand why. My first idea was, okay, maybe we can relate the percentage of uh, Peruvian writers in Wikipedia with the population, how, how many people are. It makes sense. Basically, you have Lima with a lot of population. This is like a linear correlation. Okay, basically, you have Lima, a lot of people in both cases. Lima most uh, have more writers in Wikipedia. You have here the this in red, it should be green probably. I can I should change the colors. Okay, you can see the Amazon is red. Okay, they are in the lowest position. Basically, it means that population is a good predictor, okay, of the visibility of uh, the regions in Wikipedia. Okay, uh, less population, less writers in the in the Spanish or Quechua Wikipedia. It makes sense. It also makes sense with the uh, GDP, the gross domestic product, okay? Uh, areas with most, more domestic product have more writers on Wikipedia. Also, you have the, in red the Amazonian regions, okay? You, when you have less gross uh, GDP, you have less writers on Wikipedia. Basically, areas who have more people and have more money have more re representation in the digital world. That's the idea, okay? More money, more people, more representation. More digital representation, I think that, that, that's the word. Okay, more people, more money, more digital representation. And something that uh, I also wanted to research is internet access, because maybe it makes sense that areas with more internet access, probably they have more writers, have more representation in the digital world, in Wikipedia, and that probably makes sense for us right now but when we analyze the Peruvian case, it doesn't make sense. Basically, in Peru, okay, basically in Peru you have all the regions have more than 50% of access. Here you can see that, or more than 40, sorry, more than 40% of access. You mean that more than 40% of people access to internet in every Peruvian region, okay? But, but you can see that there is not a linear correlation here. You have areas with more, about like 60% of access, Okay, but have zero writers on Wikipedia. There is not a predict. There is, there is not a relation. Okay, internet access cannot predict the number of writers in Wikipedia, and that's interesting. And I have an explanation for that. Uh, in Peru, when you access internet, you basically use this a uh, cell phone. Eighty percent of people who access internet use a cell phone. How many people use a desktop? Like five percent. The other 15% usually use tablets or another, another kind of uh, technology. It means that 
80% of people use a cell phone. Cell phone is not the best way to uh, create a Wikipedia entry about a writer. Or it's not common. We don't use the cell phone to research, for example. Or we don't use uh, the cell phone to, you know, to use our studio in order to do this kind of visualizations. No, it's not the best way. It's about technology. What technology we use to access internet in Peru? 80% of people use cell phones. They don't have desktops. They don't have laptops. Basically, they have the cell phone as the only way to access the internet. Probably that's an explanation about why internet access is not a good predictor of the internet representation. And this is, this is by basically my dissertation. Okay? I explored this. I wanted to explain that these inequalities in the internet representation, but I envision digital humanities in general like that next step. For me, all digital humanities project should be a public humanities project. With public humanities project, I mean, I, I, you should remember, every digital humanities project should provide open access to the data, but we also engage, should engage the community in order to create this public humanities project, projects that can help the community. For me, that's the idea of digital humanities. Is that the next step? They are also related: digital humanities and public humanities uh, uh, projects. And this is the basically this is the, like the workflow. Okay, that's something that I want to do in the future. Using and the, my dissertation was the first step, and that's something that I want to do. The idea is: okay, we have a lot of pro uh, literary production in Amazonian regions. We have really a lot but you cannot find that in this information in Wikipedia. That we have to do something to improve the digital representation of the Amazonian literature in Wikipedia. That's the idea. What we can do. Okay? And that, as, that's, that, this is the, the workflow that I want to do in the future. Okay, first, of course, we need research and funding. Okay, for the reason I talk about a lot about funding at the beginning of the presentation. Um, we have to engage local communities. For me, the solution is not, okay, to, right now, please just, you know, you can use, and this is not the solution for me, something like, we can use our laptops right now to create Wikipedia entries about the Amazonian writers in Peru. That's something that maybe is a good way to start. But we need, we need the local communities to understand the importance of data representation. Local communities should be the people who create these entries. They should use this, all this digital uh, technology in order to narrate their own histories or their own stories. They should use this technology. Of course, we have the technology, we have the desktops, we have the computer, we have the knowledge, okay, but we should engage communities in order to do the same. We need funding, we need funding to have the, something like a DH lab. We, we need funding in order to uh, have workshops in order to teach how to create, how to edit a, a Wikipedia entry. And something that we can do, something that is very popular in uh, the digital humanities community in uh, the United States is something that they call minimal computing. That basically means do digital research using something minimal. For example, we can think about can we create, edit, Wikipedia entries using just the cell phone. If we can do that, it means that they also can do that. Because remember, 80% of the population in Peru use this. They don't have desktops, they don't have laptops. They have, they have this. That's the idea of minimal computing. We can teach these local communities how to use just a cell phone in order to create and edit Wikipedia, Wikipedia entries. That's another possible solution. Of course, first we have to learn how to do that in the best way possible. <coughs> And a lot with local communities, I think about Amazonian writers, Amazonian literary scholars, and Amazonian Wikimedia editors. Again, it's, it's their responsibility to understand the importance of data representation uh, in Wikipedia. Of course, we use all this in order to create and edit Wikipedia entries. Okay, and we want to improve the visibility and the data representation of the Amazonian literature. And we can do the same for every country in Latin America, or I think uh, around the world, okay? We have, uh, you, you, you remember we have uh, like 
49 indigenous languages in Peru, but we have only two Wikipedias in indigenous languages. We have Quechua and Aymara. We should start thinking about the idea of Wikipedia being Amazonian indigenous languages. That's most, more difficult, of course, but that's something that we can also do okay, with the data humanities projects. And this is a kind of loop, because when we finish this, we have to go back and we, we can start again with another language, with another region in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in South Korea, okay, and this a loop. Every time we have to come back, we have to research again, because a common problem in Wikipedia is you can create a Wikipedia entry. The problem is how long this Wikipedia entry uh, stay in the, in, in, the, in the data inside Wikipedia. That's something different. You can create the Wikipedia article. The problem is how many people check this article how many people engage in the creation and in the edition of the Wikipedia article. For me, this is the future of the data humanities in Latin America. We have to, you, we have that, again, we have the technology, we have the idea, we have the knowledge, we have to go outside, and we have to, we have to engage new communities, and we have to create these public humanities projects. Uh, projects that can engage community and help community in order to improve, in this case, improve visibility and data representation. Uh, and that's all. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And I will